Our final presentation is from Eric, who will discuss his approach to successfully growing audiences in local communities through producing some of the largest cultural events in the country, including the Auckland Diwali Festival and the Lantern Festival. Uh, hi everyone, thank you for um, inviting me to come to talk on this, um, this panel. Um, fantastic, fantastic presentations there. And um, supposedly, as Sonia instructed, the applause comes at the end, so I get all the applause. <laughs> <laughs> so just to paint a picture here, um, I went to primary school in the mid-1970s here in uh, New Zealand, and in the school there was um, uh, three Māori families, uh, one Chinese family, and the rest were Pākehā New Zealanders. So, not much diversity as such. Um, my family owned and operated uh, two shops. There was a, a green grocery and a fish and chip shop. And um, growing up, I didn't feel like becoming an accountant or a dentist or a doctor. So I graduated from Whetere Polytech um, uh, with a, one of the inaugural craft design diplomas. And um, and, I'm, and over the last decades, I've been very fortunate to have worked on a really diverse uh, range of proje projects, and they've covered a wide range of genres, as well as uh, very diverse communities as well. Um, as is usual for people in the creative industry, uh, you've got to take on very different projects yourself. Um, and so I've been able to work um, on gigs like the New Zealand International Art Festival, uh, Dragon Boat Festival, Cuba Street Carnival, uh, and Te Papa. Um, in theatre and television, and um, as, a, as an art tutor as well. Um, jobs outside the creative art industry um, essentially started when I was eight years old, when I was serving in the family shop, and um, subsequently holiday jobs as an amusement park uh, duty manager, and um, in and, and various kitchens in my family's restaurants and kitchens. Some you may, some Wellingtonians may remember Kenny's Cafe, that was um, belonged to my family, and. Uh, so you probably took a 2 a.m. chicken sandwich <laughs> and a cup of tea at Kenny's Cafe. So Kenny taught me how to cook steaks. <laughs> Kenny is actually still working, um, cooking in the Petoni Workingmen's Club. So, a bit of history there. Um, another bit to that was the, um, just down the road from Kenny's Cafe, uh, there was a little sign that said the club. And um, I painted that sign. Um, <laughs> but up the stairs, Essentially, it was a, a Chinese gambling den. <laughs> so, go in there, mahjong games, card games, uh, clouds of smoke, um, bottles of EXO brandy, and the occasional police raid, <laughs> which uh, made for yeah, an exciting life. But that's, I guess that's illustrating a quick, uh, my, my journey so far in diversity, living the diversity, as, as compared to the mainstream. Um, so right now, um, doing these gigs here. I'm, I'm an event producer for Auckland Tourism, Events and Economic Development. And um, I was part of the um, uh, previous Auckland City Council, which transitioned into AT as we um, developed the, uh, delivered the Rugby World Cup 2011 project. Um, the Diwali Festival and the Lantern Festival are delivered in partnership with the Asian New Zealand Foundation. And their mandate is equipping New Zealanders to thrive in the Asian century. So there's a whole level of um, strategy, uh, mandate remit in terms of a governmental level uh, where the policymakers see the country going and it's, it's going in this direction here. Um, Diwali Festival has been um, in operation since uh, 2002. Uh, right now there's about 50 food and craft stalls, that are staged entertainment and um, uh, decoration and, and indoor activities as well. The, um, the Lantern Festival, uh, it's been going since 2000. Uh, it's a four-day event now with a uh, hundred odd food and craft stalls, um, staged entertainment uh, at 800 lanterns, and um, 200,000 audience. Uh, over 200,000 audience went to the last lantern festival at the domain. So, in terms of the the, um, the strategies that um, are in place, then these are examples, rock hard examples of. That, that like, question was referred to the, the quota system or the um, you know strategy about well this is one of those where it's, it's demonstrating that you can go above and beyond that um, ticking that box. Um, the other image there, uh, which was last year, which was the uh, welcome back for the All Blacks um, after winning the Rugby World Cup, um, which I produced, and I'll go into that, that a bit later on. <coughs> 
Whoops, the other way. So, no. Am I putting this? Oh, there you go. Um, areas that I work on in terms of uh, making these events happen, one, one of the components is about engagement. And um, this method, what I'll tell you about now, just it works for me. So I seek to foster a genuine engagement with the community um, that's relevant to the, to the event that's happening. And it goes also, it goes a bit deeper than just being me as the representative of the major events team at ATED. Um, it involves me as Eric Nan fronting up and, and being part of that, um, which also means uh, to a degree my personal reputation is on the line as well, not just the corporate reputation. So that means I've actually got skin in the game myself. Okay, um, so I say for genuine engagement, you need to genuinely engage. So it's sort of a, you know, but you, I think you get what I mean. <laughs> Not so profound, but um, so I, I seek to be um, in that community and, um, and then, I, then I feel I can effectively engage. Um, and this can take years. Yeah, it's, not a, it's not a quick fix. Um, the, without sort of being too or not condescending, but you know, after you gain the trust of the community, um, then you can, you can make a whole lot of um, components work better and smoother. But the other end of that is not just about getting the gigs across the line, but sometimes um, when you get into trouble, okay, the community will back you up because they trust you. This happened several times. And, um, and it's made that transition from friction to solution really quick. And that means it's a quick turnaround for the project. And if you talk about that in, in project management speak, well then the critical path stays online. Okay. Um, you, can, you can still work comfortably and, and successfully uh, with any community um, without years of engagement. But it probably takes a, um, which Belinda said earlier, it probably moves into a bit just more of a, a transactional relationship. Okay, and then the booking the group, come and perform, or doing some entertainment or something like that. And that, that's okay at a certain level, but um, what I seek, I said before, I'm seeking a, a deeper connection there. Um, because that leads into, uh, for me, leads into a better outcome at the end of it. And more sustainability at the end of it as well. Um, Sometimes I turn away requests um, that come to me seeking engagement with a particular community. An example is, is, is a sort of quote, um, we're looking, like someone will give me a call, we're looking for a scene of different cultures for our TV advertisement. Uh, Eric, it'd be great if we could get about 50 people, come young and old, come along. Um, that'd be a great fun day, um, there's no pay, um, but they can show off their traditional dance and their costumes and it'd be awesome. And, 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 I, and I'll be the, um, I'll be the gatekeeper there. I'll say, well, I said, thanks very much. Um, um, this doesn't really, um, you know, suit, um, you know, what, what I'm aiming for. And um, I won't even pass that request on, okay? So th there's a, you know, superficial level of engagement. Um, and it's that, well, well, we'll pick some people to come along, they have nice colors, and it looks good on camera, and it looks good as a, um, as a sort of representation. Um, but more and more, Corporate organisations are they are um, they are listening to people like you guys in the room. Okay, they are working out. Okay, we've got to actually do a bit of a step change in how we engage with these communities. Um, just actually, just last week, I won't actually name the organisation, the, the company, but it went something like this. Previously, our executive team would shy away from going for a diversity strategy because they thought they needed to hire a whole new call centre who could speak Hindi or Mandarin. Okay. Um, well, well, no. The the very vast majority of Mandarin and Hindi speakers in New Zealand can speak English. Some of them may not be fluent, but um, the call centre is not the gaping hole of failure that you're probably um, probably looking at. It. The um, but the, rather the leap of faith needs to be folded into the main strategy at the top level, and this this wholeheartedly shows that the company is serious about diversity. And they go on to say, Eric, we think that by partnering with you and your festivals, uh, we can demonstrate this on the ground and we can both benefit from um, this, this collaboration. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, brilliant strategy. Yeah, bring it on, hallelujah. Um, and this was just last week, okay. 
So they are, companies are hiring people now who have an awareness, who are a bit woken up to the idea that it's, um, it's the, uh, the mainstream working with the diverse audiences um, uh, is, is not just a, a strategy, but it should be fundamental to how you're working. One of the other images here, when I just talk about engagement, is um, uh, Call of the Sparrows. Um, image just taken a couple of weeks ago. I know that Pretty Asian Theatre are in the house. Um, I first connected with them, um, Pretty Asian Theatre, when they performed Renee Liang's play uh, Lantern, which was part of the 2014 Lantern Festival. And um, yeah, I believe every night was sold out, and I think they had to add a matinee as well. So great success there. Um, but I, I was invited to sit in on Pretty Asian Theatre's uh, first play reading of their new theatre piece. And, um, and I'm going forward, I'll be popping in occasionally um, to help, to provide my assistance um, and knowledge. And um, this bit here is, is, yes, it is connected to the work that I do, but it's also connected to the fact that I, I believe in um, what the group is doing. And um, as I said before, the, the New Zealand that I grew up in is very different to what um, this Pretty Asian Theatre group is doing. There's, um, there was about 17 people involved in the production um, and there's about 12 different ethnicities sitting in there and, and, some, and with, with mixed as well. But, um, but yeah, we're looking at a group of people that are not actually doing it because they want to aim for a diversity um, you know, objective or so forth. They're just doing it because they're awesome practitioners and they've got passion for their art and, um, and the outcome can tick some boxes as well, which is very useful, that's fine. But I still wanted them to have a really good gig. I want their gig to fly. Okay, so I'm quite happy to, to do that. Um, well, you know, it's, it is free of charge, but um, there's, there's a different sort of investment that I'm, I'm prepared to put into that. So I'm just talking about some of the, um, some of the I, I term them platforms in terms of how I program um, these festivals. And um, so we've got the uh, Lantern Festival on the left-hand side there, uh, Diwali Festival, uh, street performance, and then the Lantern Festival again with the lanterns and the trees. Um, so these festivals, I'm, I'm conscious, of course, that I'm not the subject expert in each respective culture that, that comes across my table. So in my wider team, I contract in uh, program coordinators. I, I contract in mentors and so forth that are relevant to those communities, that are standing in those communities, and um, that are um, ongoing practitioners in those communities as well. Um, this is strategically, yes, that, that's useful for a couple of reasons. One, like I said, I'm not the expert, but um, those program coordinators interact with the community on a level that I, I can't. Um, and also they also know themselves, personally, a large majority of the talent that's uh, coming into the festival as well. Um, they give advice you know, um, to the program. If for some reason a performance comes in that um, wants to be on stage but doesn't fit, um, you know, they, they know the lyrics, they, is it appropriate, those sort of, um, you know, hygienic sort of factors. Um, really, really simple to get across the line without me pretending I can judge, um, you know, a dance form uh, from East India, compare it with a, a song form from um, South India. Um, but also part of this, what I also try and achieve is that by working with these practitioners from these communities, I'm doing a bit of um, capability development uh, myself. So they're working with me at a, at a major events level in terms of uh, strategy and system and process that I know that, you know, well, one day, five past eight on a Saturday, I'll win Lotto and I'll, and I'll go off overseas somewhere. But, um, but I know that um, I'm leaving the, helping the community to, to develop their capability and to continue this work as well. Um, so the main stage is a, yeah, as we see there, is, a, is a, one of the biggest platforms as such, um, VIP ceremony, most visibility, most prestigious. Um, but what I went about developing for this, um, for the Diwali festival there was the um, street performance uh, zone. Um, and that was put together for several reasons. Uh, we used to have a couple of different um, large stage, a couple of smaller stages for that, but, um, but not everyone wanted to be on the small stage. You know, they, they wanted the prestige of the large stage. And, and, um, but over the years, um, you know, some groups have, you know, on the day, they, they withdraw from performing at the festival for whatever reason, and so I've got a gap in the programme. OK, 
Okay, the large, large majority of these performances are provided as a um, uh, participation in the community. It, it's um, it's a volunteer performance, and um, so I'm at the, um, at the at the at the rigor of how the community may feel on the day sometimes. Um, so one of the um, things to think about there was well, if I've got a stage and it's not if there's no one on it, well then that's a waste of money. And the crowd is going to think it sucks. So I said let's let's look at a different sort of situation where we do a street performance type zone where we don't have to put a printed program up, we don't have to set up a stage. Um, and that means if somebody pulls out on the day, it's okay because the audience won't see. Um, and, and we use this as a bit of a um, uh, usefulness if, if an extra team turns up as well, which does happen, so we can, just, we can slot them in there. But of course, uh, performing outside is weather dependent. Um, so, but even then, some of the outdoor stages, even if it did rain, um, and, and it finished, finished raining and then the, 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 the stage is still wet so we couldn't use the stage anyway. But over the years I've been working with these uh, street performance groups and trying to teach them how to choreograph their performance to a street performance in the 360. Challenging that um, notion of that, that stage audience to be a bit of a stage audience sort of dynamic. And that also useful thinking there also moulds into the theme of, of Diwali about that um, about, about the, the feel of India, that um, the streets are full of energy. And that has picked up a bit of traction there with the groups that come on board year on year now because some of them select the street performance only. They don't want to be on the main stage, it's no longer working for them. Um, the lantern decorations, of course, is um, one of the massive key aspects of the Lantern Festival. That in itself is a, a platform in terms of programming. They are um, unique handmade lanterns uh, from China, um, but also we've been able to um, work with our sponsors and several sponsors now over the years have commissioned uh, their own lanterns um, and that's, that part of it is ensuring that the content that's on the festival is relevant to the festival, uh, trying to get away from a big sponsor just putting up their branding and handing out pamphlets. I want their involvement on the day to be content and so we've got several um, uh, commissioned lanterns now and easily cost no less than $10,000 each plus maintenance. So. The other part of the lanterns is also um, uh, sister city lanterns that, that Auckland City has with, with other uh, Chinese cities. So we're able to develop, um, use, that, use this platform as a, as a relationship development tool as well. Uh, I, um, I lean on this term, edutainment. Um, it's, a bit, it's a bit sort of pithy, but um, yeah, that uh, entertainment education mix. Um, essentially, these, these festivals are a full platform for edutainment, where you're inviting an audience to come in and you know come and share the day, but also leave the day with something that they've learned. And if you're not presenting it in a lecture type style, um, then you've got to think about how you uh, reshape what happens on stage or in the room um, to ensure that it's true to it's true to the art form, it's true to the culture, but also the audience member is going to walk away with some knowledge about what it's all about. Um, so three examples there is the, on the left hand side is actually the Lantern Festival um, on the Thursday which is the um, uh, Lantern only night which I developed. Uh, literally lanterns only, no food, no entertainment. Um, I, I got a call from the, um, the Blind Citizens Association of Auckland and they said they wanted to do a tour through the festival and so I'm going well okay, how does a blind citizen enjoy essentially a visual festival? Um, Basically, it's, a, it's an audio described tour. Um, the, the woman in red there, she's the group leader and she's got a, a microphone and the others have um, earpieces. And she will travel them through the festival with their minders. And um, in terms of a uh, visual impairment, of course, it's not just all 100% you know, black, can't see anything. Um, in terms of um, a, a visual impairment, it, it could have come on later in life. Um, you know, maybe you, you can see shades or shadow and so forth. Um, so they'll be talking about things like, well, in front of us now is a um, traditional scene of, a, of, a, of, a, of an ox with a um, young Chinese boy sitting on the ox, it's about three metres wide, um, there's, there's red on the boy's cape and so forth, and the bit that I added when I joined this tour, I come in and also add, add a bit more colour to the dialogue in terms of uh, where they are in the park, um, they could be going past a certain tr heritage tree that's in the, in the park there. And I'll give them a bit of background. And this tree was planted by Prince Albert in 1835. 
that sort of thing. And next to and this certain lantern has a certain um, uh, provenance to Southeast China, for instance. And so that's uh, become a, a really interesting uh, work stream and amongst my overall work stream in terms of developing accessibility into these festivals. Um, uh, up top right, um, uh, this is one of our sponsors, ASB, and they've got a large inflatable uh, marquee. And we commissioned um, artist Tiffany Singh to install a um, art installation there, which was um, uh, really, really successful in terms of um, getting audience one to interact with the sponsor, which uh, which the sponsor really needs to get, but also making that interaction relevant to the festival, um, and a um, and, and in, with a with a bit of you know a strong bit of artistic integrity, integrity as well. Um, then the one on the below there is our, our Lantern Festival uh, Chinese Tea Ceremony uh, demonstration, which we do in partnership with the Confucius Institute, and um, yeah, so they they learn about. Um, tea ceremony, um, uh, the, the pouring, the, the washing of the cups and so forth. And it's a nice, um, also it's a nice wee area to, to sit down away from the general environment of the big festival. Um, another thing that I have rolled in with, the, uh, well, I'm seeking to roll in with the Diwali festival is a element which talks about Indian words, um, sorry, English words of Indian origin. So it was like pundit, uh, veranda, juggernaut, jungle, shampoo. Um, so those words have been infused into English language, and there's a level of learning to be uh, had in that area. Um, Thank you for the time. Okay, I need to quickly fast get quicker. Um, okay, so I'll talk about this bit here, which is um, I talk about integrity uh, in terms of developing these festivals and. Over the years, people have said, okay, we want a festival, um, you know, that uh, represents the Chinese people, um, the culture, et cetera, et cetera, and with a level of authenticity that's got to be, um, uh, you know, to be, to be true. Uh, I think I, I challenge that word authenticity a bit uh, in terms of who's the judge of authenticity and also knowing full well that um, culture also moves and progresses and develops. Um, we know this by food, basically, you know, chicken tikka masala. Um, lemon chicken, um, th those sort of elements, those sort of food items were not found in, in traditional China, but they were developed in different countries. Um, there's a, um, a little wee thing that I experienced uh, several months ago, uh, or last year, going through um, one of the markets was, I was walking past a pork bun stall, and I overheard this young boy look in, and he said, um, oh, I thought pork buns were Samoan, why are there Chinese working in there? So there's a, um, yeah, I think this is another, nice, yeah, culture is shifting. So I, I aim for um, cultural integrity in terms of what I try and put on stage and, and put in front of the audience. Uh, because even if a family has been living in New Zealand for the last three generations, um, their the ethnic origin is Indian, but um, what they want to do on our stage um, definitely has cultural integrity to it. But if you were to think, if you were to think it was authentic, well then, it's three generations removed from the, um, the original place it came from. Um, and just one last bit there, which is the, um, the All Blacks Welcome Home. Um, what I wanted to roll in there was a, a kaupapa of um, Māori and Pacific in terms of the theme of the day. Um, of course, the All Blacks won the game. Um, everything had to be planned in secret. Nothing could be announced until they had won the game. So. Um, um, I, so I was watching the game at, at, at 5.30 in the morning, I got seven emails, text messages coming, ping, 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 are we on, are we on, are we <laughs> All Blacks? And um, so we also knew that the subsequent um, uh, cities, Wellington and Christchurch, were getting a parade, but not a stage, not, not a um, televised thing like this. So I was, I was strong on, on making the cope up of Māori and, and, and Polynesian. Um, Back in the 2011 Rugby World Cup, the, the first voice that was heard at the opening ceremony was um, uh, Precious Clark. She, she did the karanga for the opening. And so as soon as I was given the role of producing this job, I gave Precious a call and said, hey, let, let's close this circle from the opening of the end. Let's, let's have your first voice at, at the Haka Pōwhiri as well when the All Blacks come um, down the chute. Also, we had um, in the uh, Solomio, um, the modern Māori quartet, and um, three, uh, three um, high schools who did haka. 
to the um, to the All Blacks. Um, sorry, one last thing, just because we look for a finale. Looking for the magic moment in terms of programming these big festivals. Um, fireworks for the Lantern Festival. Um, this one up there is a Diwali festival. There's a, I, I put in a DJ stage there. It goes off. It seriously goes off. The, I've found the Indian community is one that um, doesn't need to have a drop of beer to actually have an awesome time like this. <laughs> it's a rave in the middle of the street. Um, the other bit that I want to talk about there was the, down the bottom, we've got, um, uh, there was a wee viral video before the Rugby World Cup final, which is um, Kura Tiwaka Naramu from um, Gisborne. And he, his mum put a video up on YouTube saying, oh, who's your favourite player? And he said, oh, Nehi Munaskar is the best ball black ever. He's got the best sidestep. He's going to score 100 tries. And, and, and he said, um, Nehi Munaskar, if you ever come to Gisborne, my mum will cook you a cake. <laughs> so during this process of designing this, we, um, we've tracked him down. We found him worked with Air New Zealand, brought him to Auckland and put him on stage and he was able to present his hero a cake in front of the audience and there's a magic moment there which I, also, I just wanted to lean into the cultural integrity part of it because this is part of New Zealand culture. Okay? Uh, the rugby, yes, it, it's, um, it's the biggest sport in New Zealand and there's a whole lot of investment goes in there but there's still an element there which is grassroots which is formed at the level of a 10-year-old boy looking at his hero. Okay, and um, I was able to bring this boy and the hero together at a moment in time, whereas other countries, the 10-year-old boy will never see um, their hero, their sporting hero. The, the distance between that is just too far. So that's a bit about um, cultural integrity that I was um, uh, happy to put in there, because um, it related to New Zealand. I think that's enough. So great, let's give a round of applause to our five incredible um, panel speakers, Tane Mahuta Gray, Helene Wong, Lisa Tauma, Adnan and Eric Wong. Now, I had a ton of questions, probably much like you all, but unfortunately we don't have enough time. Um, and hopefully you can take those questions and uh, use them to approach your next business plan or your next creative project. And I'm sure any one of these guys will be more than happy to answer your questions during the lunch break. Um, and I think what the presentations have brought up is that they've invited us to think about how we engage with our communities, they think, to think about different approaches and strategies into how to promote these voices and importantly, the integrity behind the creative talent and the process and the passion of what drives these unique voices and what it means to find a place on our increasingly international stage. Thank you very much.